Don't you get sick of the Israel lobby trying to get us into more wars in the Middle East? Or always abusing Palestinians with your tax dollars? It once seemed like the lobby would always have full-spectrum dominance on the foreign policy discussion in D.C. But those days are over. The Council for the National Interest is the America lobby, standing up and pushing back against the Israel lobby's undue influence on Capitol Hill. Go show some support at councilforthenationalinterest.org. That's councilforthenationalinterest.org. All right, so you guys, welcome back to the show. It's my show, The Scott Horton Show. Joining me again on the line is Keegan Stephan. He is a writer, artist, activist, and organizer in New York City. His website is Keegan.NYC, Keegan.NYC, and you can follow him on Twitter at KeeganNYC. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing? I'm pretty well. How are you? I'm doing real good. Appreciate you joining us today. Uh, there's a lot of important news to cover, and by news, I mean uh, people killed by the cops. Uh, people the cops are sworn to protect, uh, in fact, killed to death by them. And um, so I don't know how long your list is from this last week or the one before that or or whatever, but um, I would say you have the floor, sir. Go ahead, introduce whichever stories you want and, and let us know what's going on. Sure, thanks. Yeah, please hop in with anything you have to say. Um, oh, I will. <laughs> Yeah, you know, something actually, um, not a killing that occurred this week, but a sort of development in a uh, police killing that occurred in New York City, which is obviously where I am and where I'm watching things most closely, um, developed this last week that is is pretty fascinating and um, enraging. Um, you know, a couple of months ago, back in or back in June, uh, police killed a man named Mario Casio in the Bronx. Um, and I remember this story coming out and it, um, you know, it being run in all of the local press, including the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal as a pretty justified shooting. Um, you know, what the press said originally was that um, they were called to the apartment by the family who said that um, an emotionally disturbed person was threatening them and that when they showed up, he was armed with a pair of scissors and lunged at them. And so they were, of course, forced to shoot him. Um since then, the NYPD has quietly, after the press cycle was over, completely revised its statement and said that Mario Ocasio was, in fact, unarmed. Um, they also originally said that he was on heroin, and that uh, toxicology reports prove that there was no heroin in his system. Um, he was only under the influence of marijuana, um, and his family says that they called because he was um, having a bad high, um, and not not in any sort of threatening way, but laying on the ground saying that he could see God. So they were worried that he was going to die, that he was incapacitated enough that he could die. And they say that when the police showed up, uh, they immediately challenged him and started hitting him with batons. And then they tased him. Uh, and when they shot him with the taser gun, uh, he went into cardiac arrest and died. And um, that was that was the end for Mario Casio. And so in other words, most, you're saying they basically called the EMS. They didn't even mean to call the police, it sounds like. Yeah, they called the EMS. Um, the police were sent, um, uh, which is pretty routine here in New York City. Um, well, I guess know, we especially if they mention drugs. Cops. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. and we have a lot more cops uh, than paramedics, or so it would seem, based on their response. And, um, and the, the NYPD does have an internal protocol. Uh, they are not supposed to make any contact with um, this classification of people uh, called emotionally disturbed people. So the radio run that went across the airwaves, I learned from speaking with the lawyer for the Ocasio family this week, um, was that there was an emotionally disturbed person uh, at this location. So when the NYPD hears that, they're supposed to go and just sort of like stand back. Uh, they're not supposed to engage unless there's imminent threat uh, to themselves or others. And Now, you know, does the family, the family have their version of what happened here? Because yeah, obviously so it's member, not that he lunged at them with scissors that he didn't have. Yeah, so he didn't have the scissors. The family says that he was laying on the ground and the police stormed in and, uh, you know, started handling him, which is obviously against internal protocol. Mm -hmm. So the most shocking thing, actually, is that the family also took video of the entire incident. Uh, and then the NYPD confiscated the video in a very... Uh, in a very roundabout and seemingly illegal manner, and they have refused to release it, uh, even through requests from the lawyer. And so the lawyer has had to bring a lawsuit independent of the the, the claim for uh, injuries to the family 
just to get the video from the NYPD. And, um, but so in their version, right he's already on the ground being beaten and then they break out the taser. And then did they, exactly. did they say how many times the cops tased him or for how long or anything like that? I haven't heard how many times or for how long, just that, um, that it was the cause of death. Uh, you know, all of these questions could have been cleared up immediately if the NYPD would have released that video. Um, which is very, it's a very, uh, feels like a tactical maneuver on their part to make these wild claims about the victim and, uh, and, and, you know, basically lie. Somehow an anonymous NYPD source, um, managed to give complete untruths to the press during this press cycle, which were hugely injurious to the family and to the defense's case, um, and, and then hide the video so that it couldn't be rebutted. Um, so we'll see where that goes. It's also, it's a very interesting story about how they went about, uh, obscuring justice by taking this video. The, um, the video was taken by the nephew of Mario. Um, so when the police showed up, Mario's nephew knew well enough to start filming what the police were going to do. And he's filming it on his cell phone. Um, and then the police apparently, uh, you know, get pushy with him and he hands it to, um, Mario's partner, Mario's girlfriend, um, you know, Mario's girlfriend uh, continues to film and then pockets the cell phone. And after Mario has gone into cardiac arrest and the EMS has shown up and Mario is going to the hospital, she goes with him. Um, after Mario is pronounced dead and she's, of course, in this horrible state of shock, she uh, is, you know, calls the NYPD and she's like, where where is my, you know, my nephew, my my partner's nephew? And they said, he's at the precinct. You need to come here and show us the video if we're going to release him. So they sort of coerce her into going there and showing him the video. And then when she gets there, they tell her that they are going to uh, view the video on the cell phone and then give it back to her. So she hands them the camera and then they don't give it back to her and they don't vouch her uh, the camera. They you know, claim they never took it uh, at the time and, and do not give it back to her. And so this, the video of this uh, police killing is still not available to the public or the family or the courts. Uh, they're rejecting, you know, giving it even to the judge in the case. Man, that's really too bad she didn't email that video clip to somebody yeah. for safekeeping, for crying out loud. Just hand it to the, the one copy to the cops. Yeah, it's... Um, I know, guess she I must have been having a tough time that, that day, so cool. I guess I shouldn't say that, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, someone dies. It's uh, I think it's a really good argument for using a lot of the apps available, um, like the NW, uh, the ACLU has put out that automatically um, upload to their database of police violence. Um, you know, do things like have automatic video uploads to the cloud. It's a great argument for things like that because as savvy as you are, as good as you are at interacting with the police, um, as well as you know your rights. The police might violate their rights, uh, your rights. They might just take that camera away from you before you get a chance to do what you would want to do with it. Um, so it's or you might be in a state like this woman was in and your, you know, your your life partner has just been killed and you obviously aren't thinking straight and might make a mistake that right. can result in the police further obscuring justice. Right. Oh, well, I guess she can rest assured that they would have gotten away with it anyway. So <laughs> what difference does it make? But anyway. Um, well, uh, the case is ongoing. So actually, you know, I would urge all the listeners out there to, uh, you know, read up on this case, Mario Casio. The, the lawyer has subpoenaed the video from the NYPD. The judge has ruled that they need to give it up. Um, so now we're in the state of limbo if, if they're going to give it or if they're going to claim that it doesn't exist. Um, so you can, if you Google his name, you'll find a few articles by Newsweek, by um, Photography is Not a Crime, uh, that all link back to a petition that the lawyer and family have put out there demanding this video. So yeah. Please go check that out and demand that we get to find out what actually happened. To this. Yeah, you know, that's newsworthy itself that it made Newsweek. You know, yeah, that's the thing sure. about that's what you're doing and and what this work represents, making these local news stories national news. That's what's happening here. Social media, especially Facebook and Twitter, that's making it where despite whatever the news networks would have us concentrate on, we just can't help but notice that our feeds are full all day long of innocent people laying down dead at the hands of the cops. And, uh, yeah, this case, I think, really exemplifies that. You yeah, know, absolutely. Now, I'm sorry, we gotta, we yeah. gotta stop and take this break for just a minute, but we'll be right back, everybody, with Keegan Stefan. Follow him on Twitter at KeeganNYC. Be back in just a moment. Hey, y'all, guess what? You can now order transcripts of any interview I've done for the incredibly reasonable price of two and a half bucks each. Listen, finding a good transcriptionist is near impossible, but I've got one now. Just go to scotthorton.org slash transcripts, enter the name and date of the interview you want written up. 
Click the PayPal button, and I'll have it in your email in 72 hours, max. You don't need a PayPal account to do this. Man, I'm really going to have to learn how to talk more good. That's scotthorton.org slash transcripts. Hey, y'all, Scott Horton here for WallStreetWindow.com. Mike Swanson knows his stuff. He made a killing running his own hedge fund and always gets out of the stock market before the government-generated bubbles pop, which is, by the way, what he's doing right now, selling all his stocks and betting on gold and commodities. Sign up at WallStreetWindow.com and get real-time updates from Mike on all his market moves. It's hard to know how to protect your savings and earn a good return in an economy like this. Mike Swanson can help. Follow along on paper and see for yourself. WallStreetWindow.com. All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. I'm talking with Keegan Stephan. He is a anti-police brutality and anti-police murder activist. Uh, you can uh, check out his website, Keegan.NYC. Follow him on Twitter, at KeeganNYC. And uh, so at the break, we're talking about, well, this activism, what's happening here is, uh, despite what TV would prefer... The uh, And really, I think the watershed was Mike Brown and the desecration of his corpse and the complete insane 3rd Infantry Division uh, shock and awe type response to the protest movement that night yeah. uh, that, that came out. That was what finally was the straw that broke the camel's back as far as major media being forced to recognize all the rest of the coverage and all the alternative and social media in America up to our eyeballs in police killings. And the thing of it is, is you don't have to be political at all. You don't have to be, you know, interested in this kind of subject at all. You're just a regular person in America. You see over and over again people shot and killed by the cops who were not in the middle of a bank robbery, right? Like somebody robs a bank or mugs some old lady and then the cops shoot him, but in the back, you know, the average American is going to say, shouldn't have been robbing people, dude. Sorry if you got it in the back, but too bad for you or whatever, right? But then this headline is, no, this guy was just broken down on the side of the road. And they won't tell us what happened, but now he's dead. Or this guy, he was riding a a horse and buggy, taking people on a ride, and the cop pulled him over because apparently didn't have the right reflector the cop believed. And so, oh, yeah, and then one, two, skip a few, and he was shot seven times in the chest, and now he's a dead man. Or the kid, the the young, rich, white kid who flashed his lights at the cop for driving around with his high beams on all night and being too stupid. He admitted people were flashing their brights at him all night because he was too stupid to figure out you got to pull it backwards, dude, or whatever his problem was. Uh, so um. he killed this kid. And this is is what is catching everybody's attention that even TV and the major papers can no longer is ignore is we're talking about people who are just living their life. They're not in the middle of committing uh, a capital crime. They're just living their life and somehow they're ending up dead at the hands of the cops. And we're supposed to believe over and over and over and over again that they're the ones who are doing it, right? These everyday Joes are all just dying for their first opportunity to try to kill a cop and give them no choice but to shoot him to death. I mean, that couldn't possibly be right, and everyone knows it. All 300 million of us know it. Yeah, and we're finally uh, finally trying to expose it, and I think you're right that social media is making that happen. Uh, you know, in the case we were discussing before the break of Mario Casio, uh, the news media and the local the local news media... And the police were going to run the story that he was a violent threat, and then it turned out to be completely not true. Um, one of the more egregious examples we've seen of that recently was the case of Jeremy McDole. Um, this is uh, the man who you might have seen the YouTube video of that went extraordinarily viral. He was uh, in a wheelchair, um, you know, in the street, appearing to be in pain. Um, police ordered him to put his hands up. And when he went to put his hands up, like very obviously, they just gave a command to raise his hands. He took his hands out of his pocket and started to raise them. They shot him and killed him. Uh, didn't try any less lethal force. Didn't wait to see a weapon. Uh, he falls over dead in this extremely, extremely dis disturbing video um, that made the rounds first on YouTube and social media and then in the mainstream press. And once again, the police tried to cover it up. Um, they tried to immediately run a narrative that... Um, that Jeremy McDole was armed, that he had a gun on him. Um, and, you know, the, uh, the justice, um, advocates on social media, uh, did not believe it and kept pressing the issue and looking into it and demanding more. And then the police admitted that they found the gun very far away from the body. Um, you know, it's not in the video anywhere and it was not discovered like sort of under his body or in his pocket. Um, 
and there was there was clearly no gun visible, so clearly no reason to shoot. Uh, and like you were saying, you know, they were trying to justify it, but I don't think that there is a person in America who could say that that was a justified shooting and killing, aside from some like literally professional uh, police apologists. Yeah, I mean, and of course, if you watch that video, it's so easy to see. Well, geez, they could have just snuck up behind him and dumped him right out of the chair. Right. Yeah. And you know what? He could have hit his head real hard. I'm not saying that would have been the right thing to do necessarily. But, you know, the idea that, the, geez, these four jocks had no choice but to kill yeah. the crippled guy in the chair who, as as uh, in this uh, International Business Times story uh, says, uh, he was already shot before they completely unloaded on him. He had already been shot yeah. at least once. Yeah. And yeah, But even and then, he... they had no choice but to shoot him ten more times. What? Yeah, he was, you know, if you watch the video, he's clearly not posing a danger to, there's no one around. He's like, even if he had a gun, he's not like going to be shooting at anyone. He's, um, you know, he's, he's hurting. And, uh, and instead of like, you know, yeah, sneak up behind him, wait it out, uh, you know, until you can speak with him or like, like gain a little more knowledge of what's going on. They, they literally shoot him, you know, within seconds of, of finding him there in a wheelchair in the middle of the street, um, bleeding. Yep. And uh, back to the whole thing about how everybody knows better than this is even some, not all necessarily, I guess, right? But I would say most hardened criminals would never shoot a cop, never kill a cop. You don't do that even if you're the mob, right? You can get in (laughs) real trouble if you do that, right? But we're supposed to believe these cops really believe that these everyday people are trying to kill them every day. You know, young people of color like the, the the story told by Darren Wilson about Mike Brown was so utterly unbelievable because being a young person of color in Ferguson, you have lived under tremendous police discrimination and pressure. And, you know, people are afraid of the police. The people that I organized with in New York City who grew up in the Bronx, um, you know, the idea that, yes, people are are uh, unarmed, attacking the police, trying to, like, take their weapons when uh you know, we fear them and know that they might do violence unprovoked is is pretty unimaginable and like shocking that they can still put out that nor- narrative with a straight face on a day to day basis. Yeah. Well, you know, the the kid with the high beams who uh, flashed his lights at the cops, he was on his way home from church. Uh, same thing here with this guy, Corey Jones, that you link to in your Twitter feed here. He was on his oh. way home. He was a church musician. On the way home, his car broke down. He's on the side of the road. How could this possibly... You know, it's sort of like the Branch Davidians. Oh, yeah, it was an ambush. Well, who was on whose property, right? Who's attacking who? How could it possibly be that Corey Jones, the church musician, was putting himself in the position to kill a cop that night? It just couldn't be. The cop was looking for an excuse to murder somebody. Now, that sounds pretty plausible to me. He found somebody that he thought he could kill and get away with killing, and so now there's a dead body. He doesn't have a great working car. Yeah, I mean, the story is just... The police narrative is unbelievable that this guy's this guy's car broke down on his way back from a gig, a regular uh, church musician, and he then decided, you know, he was going to attack the cop that showed up to help him. That's uh, completely unbelievable, and it's another another situation where we have the police trying to uh, obfuscate justice uh, and obfuscate the truth um, just to protect themselves, which is really disappointing. Really to see the lo- really disappointing to see the local press. Um, you know, repeating their narrative without just like if you're going to if, even if you feel the need to posts what they said you know tear it apart uh, yeah and how about police claimed instead of police notified us of the truth of being yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah thankfully we've got um sean king writing for the daily news in new york now who reported on this pretty well if you want to read a uh, you know uh, a better yeah. story on it and i don't um, mean to say yeah. that church folk are never violent or whatever but it's a it's a little bit uh Outside of the common narrative that, you know, church musicians, car breaks down, so he figures out a plan to murder a cop and almost got away with it, too. You know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, just read the article. Uh, they're, they're totally, like, pushing, giving accurate accounts away as far as possible. They're not saying if he had a weapon, which, uh, you know, by not saying they're trying to let people make that argument, uh, build this whole false narrative. Um, they said that it might take months to complete the investigation, sort of giving them a window to not release factual information. The whole thing um, just reeks of a cover up. Um, so there's a very dangerous precedent for the police to not be able to release information to the public when this is such a hot topic. And, and uh, 
you know, our whole democracy is is based on the idea that we can see what our government is doing, how it's operating so that we can vote if we want to change it. And uh, even that, you know, little bit that we're supposed to have to control our rights is being obfuscated by the police when they do things wrong. Yep, absolutely. And now um, I want to uh, end with this one. U.S. police killed at least 101 people in September, more than three per day. And uh, just please tell us uh, where we can find that out for ourselves. Um, yeah, so I shared a graphic um, today on Twitter um, that shows that in pretty stark terms. Um, and the source is on the graphic there in the bottom right hand corner, killedbypolice.net. Um, there's, they've sort of been doing this um, recording of police killings the longest, and they are, you know, mining um, local news sources. And they they post it up pretty pretty straightforward. It looks like an Excel sheet of all the cases, but they put links to the articles. Um, you know, and a lot of those are obviously the sort of problematic articles we've been talking about that just um, regurgitate the police narrative. Um, but, you know, you can look into them and see further. Um, you know, what should be shocking to anybody is that uh, 101 people were killed by the police. And there are countries that uh, like England, you know, that kills uh, fewer people than that in 100 years. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, there's a problem here. There are problems here that need to be fixed. And the sheer numbers alone should be inspiring us to do something about it. Um, Man. Yeah, you know, I actually clicked on the like, picture there like I should in the first place. 898 killed in the last 10 months. Man, yeah, and that doesn't man. even include October, which has been a bloody month as well. So, and yeah. that's um, you know, I, I always write when I say this many people have been killed by cops. I always write at least because right. those are the ones that were reported, and there are, there are surely some that even um, all of our watchful eyes can't document. Right, man. All right. Well, listen, I uh, really appreciate your time on the show. I'd really like to do this every Monday or every other Monday or whatever you think is right, and and keep this as yep. a regular deal and try to. Good. Try to, to name and, and at least try to humanize the victims here a little bit when we get a chance to, you know, tell people the truth about what's happened to them. Yeah, and we'll be out in Union Square tonight doing just that for Jerry McDowell, the, um, the man in the wheelchair who was killed by the police. So oh, great. If you're free in New York City, come to Union Square at 7 p.m. tonight for a vigil. Well, I'm far from there, but uh, I'm sure <laughs> I know there are some people up there who are listening, so uh, maybe they'll see you. All right, thanks very much again. No problem. All right, so that is Keegan Stephan. He's uh, on Twitter at Keegan NYC at Keegan NYC, and his website is Keegan dot NYC. Uh, doing a great job of keeping track of police killings, and uh, again that footnote he mentioned there, killed by police dot net, a private open source, uh, free citizen attempt to uh, keep track of these police killings for you there. Hey, I'm Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new ebook by longtime Future Freedom author Scott McPherson. Freedom and Security, the Second Amendment, and the Right to Keep and Bear Arms. This is the definitive principled case in favor of gun rights and against gun control. America is exceptional. Here the people come first, and we refuse to allow the state a monopoly on firearms. Our liberty depends on it. Get Scott McPherson's Freedom and Security, the Second Amendment, and the Right to Keep and Bear Arms on Kindle at Amazon.com today. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here for MPV Engineering. This isn't for all of you, but for high-end contractors specializing in industrial construction and end users who own and operate industrial equipment, MPV offers licensed professional consulting on chemical and mechanical engineering for your projects. Tanks, pressure vessels, piping, heat exchangers, HVAC equipment, chemical reactors for oil companies or manufacturing facilities, as well as project management support and troubleshooting for those implementing designs. MPV will get your industrial project up and running. Head over to mpvengineering.com. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here. It's always safe to say that one should keep at least some of your savings in precious metals as a hedge against inflation. And if this economy ever does heat back up and the banks start expanding credit, rising prices could make metals a very profitable bet. Since 1977, Robertson Roberts Brokerage, Inc. has been helping people buy and sell gold, silver, platinum, and palladium. And they do it well. They're fast, reliable, and trusted for more than 35 years. And they take Bitcoin. Call Robertson Roberts at 1-800-874-9760 or stop by rrbi.co.